Hope, everyone is doing good. Today we will see what is the difference between investment and speculation. You have to be patient and watch the video till the end dot so that you can get to know the details fully. Investment versus speculation. This video will outline the viewpoints that will be set forth in the remainder. In particular we wish to develop at the outset our concept of appropriate portfolio policy for the individual, non-professional investor. Investment versus speculation What do we mean by investor? Throughout this video the term will be used in contradistinction to speculator. As far back as 1934, in our video security analysis, 1. We attempted a precise formulation of the difference between the two, as follows. An investment operation is one which, upon thorough analysis promises safety of principle and an adequate return. Operations not meeting these requirements are speculative. While we have clung tenaciously to this definition over the ensuing 38 years, it is worthwhile noting the radical changes that have occurred in the use of the term investor during this period. After the great market decline of 1929,193 while well, all common stocks were widely regarded as speculative by nature, a leading authority stated flatly that only bonds could be bought for investment. Two thus we had then to defend our definition against the charge that it gave too wide scope to the concept of investment. Now our concern is of the opposite sort. We must prevent our readers from accepting the common jargon which applies the term investor to anybody and everybody in the stock market. In our last edition we cited the following headline of a front-page article of our leading financial journal in June 1962, Small Investors Bearish, They Are Selling Odd Lots Short. In October 1970 the same journal had an editorial critical of what it called reckless investors, who this time were rushing in on the buying side. These quotations well illustrate the confusion that has been dominant for many years in the use of the words investment and speculation. Think of our suggested definition of investment given above and compare it with the sale of a few shares of stock by an inexperienced member of the public, who does not even own what he is selling, and has some largely emotional conviction that he will be able to buy them back at a much lower price. It is not irrelevant to point out that when the 1962 article appeared the market had already experienced a decline of major size, and was now getting ready for an even greater upswing. It was about as poor a time as possible for selling short. In a more general sense, the later used phrase reckless investors could be regarded as a laughable contradiction in terms, something like spendthrift misers, were this misuse of language not so mischievous. The newspaper employed the word investor in these instances because, in the easy language of Wall Street, everyone who buys or sells a security has become an investor, regardless of what he buys, or for what purpose, or at what price, or whether for cash or on margin. Compare this with the attitude of the public toward common stocks in 1948 when over 90% of those queried expressed themselves as opposed to the purchase of common stocks three about half gave as their reason not safe, a gamble, and about half, the reason not familiar with. It is indeed ironical the survey Graham cites was conducted for the Fed by the University of Michigan and was published in the Federal Reserve Bulletin, July, 1948. People were asked, suppose a man decides not to spend his money. He can either put it in a bank or in bonds or he can invest it. What do you think would be the wisest thing for him to do with the money nowadays? Put it in the bank, buy savings bonds with it, invest it in real estate, or buy common stock with it? Only 4% thought common stock would offer a satisfactory return. 26% considered it not safe or a gamble. From 1949 through 1958, the stock market earned one of its highest 10-year returns in history. That common stock purchases of all kinds were quite generally regarded as highly speculative or risky at a time when they were selling on a most attractive basis, and due soon to begin their greatest advance in history. Conversely the very fact they had advanced to what were undoubtedly dangerous levels as judged by past experience later transformed them into investments, and the entire stock buying public into investors. The distinction between investment and speculation in common stocks has always been a useful one and its disappearance is a cause for concern. We have often said that Wall Street as an institution would be well advised to reinstate this distinction and to emphasize it in all its dealings with the public. Otherwise the stock exchanges may someday be blamed for heavy speculative losses, which those who suffered them had not been properly warned against. Ironically, once more, much of the recent financial embarrassment of some stock exchange firms seems to have come from the inclusion of speculative common stocks in their own capital funds. We trust that the watching of this video will gain a reasonably clear idea of the risks that are inherent in common stock commitment, risks which are inseparable from the opportunities of profit that they offer, and both of which must be allowed for in the investor's calculations. What we have just said indicates that there may no longer be such a thing as a Simon Pure investment policy comprising representative common stocks, in the sense that one can always wait to buy them at a price that involves no risk of a market or quotational loss large enough to be disquieting. In most periods the investor must recognize the existence of a speculative factor in his common stock holdings. 
it is his task to keep this component within minor limits, and to be prepared financially and psychologically for adverse results that may be of short or long duration. Two paragraphs should be added about stock speculation per se, as distinguished from the speculative component now inherent, averaging 18.7% annually. In a fascinating echo of that early Fed survey, a poll conducted by Business Week at year-end 2002 found that only 24% of investors were willing to invest more in their mutual funds or stock portfolios, down from 47% just three years earlier. In most representative common stocks, outright speculation is neither illegal, immoral, nor fattening to the pocketbook. More than that, some speculation is necessary and unavoidable, for in many common stock situations there are substantial possibilities of both profit and loss, and the risks therein must be assumed by someone. There is intelligent speculation as there is intelligent investing, but there are many ways in which speculation may be unintelligent. Of these the foremost are, 1. Speculating when you think you are investing, 2. Speculating seriously instead of as a pastime, when you lack proper knowledge and skill for it, and 3. Risking more money in speculation than you can afford to lose. In our conservative view every non-professional who operates on margin plus should recognize that he is ipso facto speculating, and it is his broker's duty so to advise him, and everyone who buys a so-called hot common stock issue, or makes a purchase in any way similar thereto, is either speculating or gambling. Speculation is always fascinating, and it can be a lot of fun while you are ahead of the game. If you want to try your luck at it, put aside a portion the smaller the better of your capital in a separate fund for this purpose. Never add more money to this account just because the speculation is beneficial on two levels. First, without speculation, untested new companies would never be able to raise the necessary capital for expansion. The alluring, long-shot chance of a huge gain is the grease that lubricates the machinery of innovation. Secondly, risk is exchanged every time a stock is bought or sold. The buyer purchases the primary risk that this stock may go down. Meanwhile, the seller still retains a residual risk the chance that the stock he just sold may go up. Margin account enables you to buy stocks using money you borrow from the brokerage firm. By investing with borrowed money, you make more when your stocks go up, but you can be wiped out when they go down. The collateral for the loan is the value of the investments in your account, so you must put up more money if that value falls below the amount you borrowed. Market has gone up and profits are rolling in. Never mingle your speculative and investment operations in the same account, nor in any part of your thinking. Results to be expected by the defensive investor We have already defined the defensive investor as one interested chiefly in safety plus freedom from bother. In general what course should he follow and what return can he expect under average normal conditions, if such conditions really exist? To answer these questions we shall consider first what we wrote on the subject seven years ago. Next what significant changes have occurred since then in the underlying factors governing the investor's expectable return. And finally what he should do and what he should expect under present day conditions. 1. What we said six years ago. We recommended that the investor divide his holdings between high-grade bonds and leading common stocks, that the proportion held in bonds be never less than 25% or more than 75%, with the converse being necessarily true for the common stock component. That his simplest choice would be to maintain a 50-50 proportion between the two, with adjustments to restore the equality when market developments had disturbed it by as much as, say, 5%. As an alternative policy he might choose to reduce his common stock component to 25% if he felt the market was dangerously high, and conversely to advance it toward the maximum of 75% if he felt that a decline in stock prices was making them increasingly attractive. In 1965 the investor could obtain about 41-2% on high-grade taxable bonds and 31-4% on good tax-free bonds. The dividend return on leading common stocks, with the DJIA at 892 was only about 3.2%. This fact, and others, suggested caution. We implied that at normal levels of the market, the investor should be able to obtain an initial dividend return of between 31-2% and 41-2% on his stock purchase, to which should be added a steady increase in underlying value and in the normal market priced out of a representative stock list of about the same amount, giving a return from dividends and appreciation combined of about 71-2% per year. A half-and-half half division between bonds and stocks would yield about 6% before income tax. We added that the stock component should carry a fair degree of protection against the loss of purchasing power caused by large-scale inflation. It should be pointed out that the above arithmetic indicated expectation of a much lower rate of advance in the stock market than had been realized between 1949 and 1964. That rate had averaged a good deal better than 10% for listed stocks as a whole. 
and it was quite generally regarded as a sort of guarantee that similarly satisfactory results could be counted on in the future. Few people were willing to consider seriously the possibility that the high rate of advance in the past means that stock prices are now too high, and hence that the wonderful results since 1949 would imply not very good but bad results for the future. 2. What has happened since 1964 The major change since 1964 has been the rise in interest rates on first-grade bonds to record high levels, although there has since been a considerable recovery from the lowest prices of 1970. The obtainable return on good corporate issues is now about 71-2% and even more against 41-2% in 1964. In the meantime the dividend return on DJIA type stocks had a fair advance also during the market decline of 1969-70. But as we write it is less than 3.5% against 3.2% at the end of 1964. The change in going interest rates produced a maximum decline of about 38% in the market price of medium term say 20 year bonds during this period. There is a paradoxical aspect to these developments. In 1964 we discussed at length the possibility that the price of stocks might be too high and subject ultimately to a serious decline. But we did not consider specifically the possibility that the same might happen to the price of high-grade bonds. Neither did anyone else that we know of. We did warn on p. 90. That a long-term bond may vary widely in price in response to changes in interest rates. In the light of what has since happened we think that this warning, with attendant examples, was insufficiently stressed. For the fact is that if the investor had a given sum in the DJIA at its closing price of 874 in 1964 he would have had a small profit thereon in late 1971. Even at the lowest level 631 in 1970 his indicated loss would have been less than that shown on good long-term bonds. On the other hand, if he had confined his bond-type investments to U.S., savings bonds, short-term corporate issues, or savings accounts, he would have had no loss in market value of his principal during this period, and he would have enjoyed a higher income return than was offered by good stocks. It turned out, therefore, that true cash equivalents proved to be better investments in 1964 than common stocks, in spite of the inflation experience that in theory should have favored stocks over cash. The decline in quoted principal value of good longer-term bonds was due to developments in the money market, an abstruse area which ordinarily does not have an important bearing on the investment policy of individuals. This is just another of an endless series of experiences over time that have demonstrated that the future of security prices is never predictable. Almost always bonds have fluctuated much less than stock prices, and investors generally could buy good bonds of any maturity without having to worry about changes in their market value. There are a few exceptions to this rule and the period after 1964 proved to be one of them. We shall have more to say about change in bond prices in a later video. We have just covered the difference between investment and speculation. We will cover more details in upcoming videos. Stay tuned. Thanks for watching the video. Quick overview of this video is, why do you suppose the brokers on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange always cheer at the sound of the closing bell, no matter what the market did that day? Because whenever you trade, they make money whether you did or not. By speculating instead of investing, you lower your own odds of building wealth and raise someone else's. Graham's definition of investing could not be clearer. An investment operation is one which, upon thorough analysis, promises safety of principle and an adequate return. One note that investing, according to Graham, consists equally of three elements. You must thoroughly analyze a company and the soundness of its underlying businesses before you buy its stock. You must deliberately protect yourself against serious losses. You must aspire to adequate, not extraordinary, performance. An investor calculates what a stock is worth, based on the value of its businesses. A speculator gambles that a stock will go up in price, because somebody else will pay even more for it. As Graham once put it, investors judge the market price by established standards of value, while speculators base standards of value upon market price. Two for a speculator, the incessant stream of stock quotes is like oxygen, cut it off and he dies. For an investor, what Graham called quotational values matter much less. Graham urges you to invest only if you would be comfortable owning a stock even if you had no way of knowing its daily share price. Three, like casino gambling or betting on the horses, speculating in the market can be exciting or even rewarding, but it's the worst imaginable way to build your wealth. That's because Wall Street, like Las Vegas or the racetrack, has calibrated the odds, so that the house always prevails, in the end, against everyone who tries to beat the house at its own speculative game. On the other hand, investing is a unique kind of casino, one where you cannot lose in the end, so long as you play only by the rules that put the odds squarely in your favor. People who invest make money for 
themselves. People who speculate make money for their brokers. And, that, in turn, is why Wall Street perennially downplays the durable virtues of investing and hypes the gaudy appeal of speculation. Unsafe at high speed. Confusing speculation with investment, Graham warns, is always a mistake. In the 1990s, that confusion led to mass destruction. Almost everyone, it seems, ran out of patience at once, and America became the speculation nation, populated with traders who went shooting from stock to stock like grasshoppers whizzing around in an August hay field. People began believing that the test of an investment technique was simply whether it worked. If they beat the market over any period, no matter how dangerous or dumb their tactics, people boasted that they were right. But the intelligent investor has no interest in being temporarily right. To reach your long-term financial goals, you must be sustainably and reliably right. The techniques that became so trendy in the 1990s, day trading, ignoring diversification, flipping hot mutual funds, following stock picking systems, seemed to work. But they had no chance of prevailing in the long run because they failed to meet all three of Graham's criteria for investing. To see why temporarily high returns don't prove anything, imagine that two places are 130 miles apart. If I observe the 65 miles per hour speed limit, I can drive that distance in two hours. But if I drive 130 miles per hour, I can get there in one hour. If I try this and survive, am I right? Should you be tempted to try it, too, because you hear me bragging that it worked? Flashy gimmicks for beating the market are much the same in short streaks so long as your luck holds out. They work. Over time, they will get you killed. The next topic we will see. The investor in inflation. Our mission is to provide an online business for passive income, share market do's and don'ts, motivational speech and inspirational quotes and relaxing experience to our viewers with content that focuses on the natural beauty. We bring out the collection of best audio and video. We make most powerful videos on daily basis. Your kind support will be a great motivation and inspiration to my creation. Thank you. Please subscribe, like and comment if you like the channel. Thank you.